This week, an all-new Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. Does the vice presidential oath of office look a little too Masonic? Then we've got a great new interview with illustrious brother Frank Conway, the author of Masonic Pageant, the Northern Masonic Jurisdiction's answer, essentially, to the Scottish Rite Ritual and Monitor of the Southern Jurisdiction. Or rather, it's the closest we have in this exclusive interview set up by our legacy partner, Brother Chris Stebbins. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Hey everybody, welcome to this special episode of the Whence Came You podcast. First of all, I want to thank all of the legacy partners, producers, fellows, and contributors of the podcast who help make this podcast available all the time. To everyone, we have no backlog that is a premium subscription model or anything. It just depends on listener-supported education to fund the whole thing. So uh, we've been doing this for going on 11 years now. Uh, and it's all thanks to you. I want to thank you all so much for making this possible. And if you're curious about how to assist the podcast, then head on over to WCYpodcast.com, click on support the show, and check out all the cool ways you can help support. We've also got a shop available for you to check out as well. And all of the proceeds go, again, right back into this program. So today, we've got a couple things to cover. And uh, first and foremost... Uh, we're going to get into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother, Stephen L. Harrison. And then we're going to go into our interview, exclusive interview, with Frank Conway, the author behind the Masonic Pageant. Basically, the only book out there that discusses the historical background, context, and the degrees of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite Northern Masonic Jurisdiction. So think the Scottish Rite Ritual and Monitor for the Southern Jurisdiction, but kind of in a sort of weird way, the Northern Jurisdiction's version. Now, before we go any further, let's get into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother, Stephen L. Harrison. Eighteen. United States Vice Presidents have been Freemasons. I'll forego the laundry list of their names, which you can find online. What I want to talk about is their oath of office. The oath of office of the Vice President of the United States is not the same as the oath for the Presidency. It is, however, the same as that which members of Congress take. It has been changed over the years, but in its present form, it reads as follows. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. So any Freemason might well recognize some of that language and surmise that since several of the Founding Fathers were Masons, they had a hand in formulating the oath, and that, of course, would be wrong. The first Congress of the United States, in its very first act, specified the wording for the Vice Presidential Oath. It was a simple one and would have been the oath that John Adams took at his Vice Presidential inauguration when he would have said, I, John Adams, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That's it. Short and sweet. 
Given our legislators' seemingly insatiable appetite for wordiness, Congress added to the oath over the years until it reached its present form in 1966. Significantly, the words, So Help Me God, were added in 1862. As for the rest of it, with the wording of the current oath, it is, in fact, probable that a Freemason or two had a hand in formulating it. There are a couple of interesting vice presidential inaugural twists involving Masonic Brothers. In 1853, William Rufus King was elected to be Franklin Pierce's vice president. King, a member of Phoenix Lodge Aid in Fayetteville, North Carolina, suffered from tuberculosis and upon doctor's orders was in Havana on Inauguration Day where he became the only vice president of the United States to take the oath of office on foreign soil. He never made it back to Washington serving only 45 days in office before succumbing to the disease and never exercising any of his official vice presidential duties. In 1944, Henry A. Wallace, President Roosevelt's vice president and a member of Capitol Lodge 110 in Des Moines, Iowa, lost his bid at the convention for another term. At the time, it was tradition for an outgoing vice president to administer the oath of office to the newly elected president and vice president. It therefore became Brother Wallace's unpleasant duty to administer the vice presidential oath to the man who had defeated him in the floor fight at the convention, Masonic brother Harry S. Truman. Not only did Truman defeat him for the vice presidency, but a few months later, Wallace would have become president at the death of Brother Roosevelt. The vice president always takes his, or her, oath of office first and is therefore primed to assume the presidency in case the incoming president drops dead between the time he gets out of his seat and reaches the podium to take his oath. Our traditions are nothing if not practical. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right. How about that? All this cool stuff about the presidential, well, vice presidential election wording. Uh, did it come from a Mason? Of course, we always want to connect things back to Freemasonry. And like Steve says, it didn't. Uh, we have a tendency to be verbose in our wording and things. And, and so did Congress. And even today, uh, when we write as Masons, we tend to want to uh, project kind of a Masonic version or, or, or verbiage into our current writing to make it sound like, you know, 17th century, 18th century English. And really, it just comes across as verbose or kind of difficult to read, I guess you would say. So, uh, again, really cool facts. I want to thank illustrious Brother Harrison for another great Masonic Minute. This is 160 episodes of the Masonic Minute. Can you guys believe that? Next time you see Steve, uh, whether he's presenting or just hanging out having coffee, go shake his hand. Tell him thank you because this is incredible content and he's been doing this same thing that this podcast has been doing like his entire Masonic career. Right. Um, and he's just been so gracious to allow us to put these segments in the show. Please check out his own YouTube channel as well. It's the One Minute Mason. And of course, if you subscribe to this channel, you'll get all of the information available, uh, all the episodes, all the Masonic minutes, like they're kind of segmented out. We even create a playlist so that you can put all of your Masonic minutes together, play them at your uh, open houses and things. It really does drive a lot of great conversation. Now, let's get into this interview with illustrious brother, Frank Conway. Now, for some context, we've also got brother Chris Stebbins in the interview. Why? Because Chris Stebbins is a legacy partner and he put this thing together. It is by his uh, suggestion and all his hard work in getting us all together to make this happen. And it's an incredible story. So I want to thank Chris Stebbins for his amazing support 
uh, over all this time uh, in getting this episode together. I also want to thank Brother Conway for putting together the Masonic Pageant, this amazing book that outlines the Northern jurisdictions, degrees, and rituals in a way that makes them better understood for the entire membership. So all of those brothers out there who took Master Craftsman and said, where's the Northern jurisdiction version of this? And of course, they created the Houtgrade Academy. Well, you know what came out before the Houtgrade Academy was the Masonic Pageant. Uh, just before the launch of Hot Great Academy, actually. And it's kind of interesting. This is not just a interview with an author about a book. It's a story of unsatisfaction, then a brother coming together to make a solution, this book. Now, while the book has the uh, stamp of approval from illustrious past grand commander, David Glatley, and he says the book is uh, you know, in line with the Scottish Rite Northern Masonic Jurisdiction's visions and all of these things, yet that book is not actively promoted as such. Why? You're going to hear all about it right now. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming back to this special episode of the Whence Came You podcast. We're doing a little video with this one as well. We're lucky enough to be joined with Brother Chris Stebbins as well as Brother Frank Conway, uh, who is the author of the Masonic Pageant. If that book sounds familiar, that's because uh, it's been around for a little while now, and it is a uh, complete history of the Scottish Rite degrees in the Northern Masonic jurisdiction, which has been something that has been on the minds of most Scottish Rite Northern Masonic jurisdiction members for as long as I've been a member, and even longer. Uh, for the longest time, the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction had their ritual and monitor, which De Hoyos helped put together, um, and there's annotations and all this great stuff inside of it, but we had nothing in the Northern Jurisdiction. And finally, Brother Conway has put together something, and we're, gonna, we're, we're really happy to have him with us uh, on this special episode uh, to talk a little bit about that and some of the other things that he's involved with. So uh, welcome both of you to this special episode of the podcast. Thank you. Pleasure Absolutely. to be here, Robert. Let's get um, a quick introduction for Brother Chris Stebbins. Uh, Brother Chris, can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know where you've been and where you're coming from and your lodge? Uh, sure. A past master of Beverly Riverside Lodge, number 107 in Riverside, New Jersey. Uh, I was the junior past master from 2019. We had a two-time master because of COVID. Um, so I was enjoying uh, getting to be the junior past master for two years and jaw boning in the, <laughs> the master's year for an extra year. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was raised in 2011 um, and pretty much as you know, common, common theme got right in the officer line. Um, but I really didn't connect with Freemasonry on a deeper level until I got closer to the East. And I'm glad I did that before I got to the East to, uh, to, to make an impact um, on my lodge and, and, and really spread Masonic light. But uh, that's and how I found you. Can I tell a brief, uh, I want to give a plug for, for Brother Jack Heidi, who sure. introduced me to the Whence Came You podcast. So <laughs> say it right here. Say it right here. Um, he petitioned my lodge while I was master in 2019 and, and I raised him. And um, he came to me and said, oh, you know, uh, I'm listening to these uh, these podcasts. And I'm like, no, 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 none of that. What are you talking about? You don't want to be looking anything up. You don't who knows who those maniacs are. I don't know who those maniacs are. Don't be listening to any of that stuff. Um, suffice to say, my opinion has changed because <laughs> here I am talking to you. And I was really uh, excited that he opened my eyes to uh, the world of great uh, Masonic education that's out there when you turn over a couple rocks. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Brother Frank Conway, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your Masonic journey, you know, when you, when you came into the craft and a little bit about some of your accolades, perhaps? Well, I was uh, initiated, passed, and raised about 150 years ago. No, uh, <laughs> in uh, 75 as a matter of fact, 18, 70, no, no, uh, no just checking a little, a uh, little more up to date. And <clears throat> my lodge uh, was Heightstown. Heights, uh, it's Heightstown Apollo now, uh, 41, I believe. And uh, I got two degrees in one month because we were moon lodge and we met on or after a full moon. And there were two full moons, I believe, in January of that in 75. And so I got my first and second degree in the same month. 
And then, uh, of course, I got the, the third degree after in February. Then I just went through the chairs and eventually I became worshipful master of the lodge. And I had a pretty rough time of it because membership was already starting. I mean, the problems with membership were already starting to hit us back, even back then. Uh, often we would have more people in the chairs than we had on the sidelines. And plus we had an awful lot of firemen and cops in the chairs. And those guys, uh, they're always getting called to fire. So they have to appear in court. And, then, and a lot of times I'd have like a third of my officers missing. They just couldn't make it. So I was grabbing guys who came in and just said, well, I want you to be a master of ceremonies. Right? I want you to be, yeah, these people have been through the chairs already. And that kind of made it tough. But by and large, it was a good year. Uh, I wrote little, we had a tiny little trestle board, something about that big. And everybody liked my, I had a little thing called Chips from the Quarry, and I wrote that. Everybody liked it. They thought it was very good. Then my year was over, and uh, I went for a few, I still attended for a few more years. And then my wife became quite ill. And, uh, she eventually, she died a few months or years after that. And I stopped going to meetings. I sort of lost interest. And then I got a hold of uh, Chris Hodat's book, uh, Freemasonry for Dummies. And it just rejuvenated me. I read it and I got a whole new interest because I only belonged to Blue Lodge. I was a master mason and that's it. So I joined the Scottish Rite and boy, that changed things an awful lot. I, I dove right into that head first, got on the stage and so on. And I found that all you had to do to get ahead in masonry was find the stinkiest job nobody wanted and say, I'll do it. And I kept doing it and doing it pretty soon. <laughs> you know, I, I advanced quite a bit. Uh, and my first time in stage, well, my first time in stage, I was literally a spear carrier. So, but <clears throat> afterwards, we were sitting around shooting the breeze, and they said, you know, this guy who plays, I don't know, some relatively minor role, but he had something to say, which I didn't. And uh, I said, he's not going to make it. Oh, boy, we only got a, like a week to go. What are we going to do? I said, I'll take his role. You sure you can do that? I said, I'll have it memorized before I get home today. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how it went. It went like that. I, uh, I was sitting at home. A few weeks later, the phone rang. It was Dave Herman, our secretary. He said, oh, I hear you want to uh, join the officer's line. I said, I never said of anything the, of that the at all. I said, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I want to join the officer's line. Well, uh, what are you interested in? I said, Rose Croy. Okay, they, they have two uh, positions open, the lowest one and the next one. So he put me in the next one up, Master Ceremony. He said, oh, wow, I, I got a, an advancement. I didn't know what the Master Ceremonies had to do in the Rose <laughs> Croy. I found out pretty darn quick. Oh, my God. I couldn't I'm, believe it. I, I'm on a similar path here, Frank. Uh, well, I'm not sure I had all that other excitement, but I am my first officership in the Scottish Rite Southern Valley is Master Ceremonies in the Rose Croy line. <laughs> That's well, what I'm doing right now. You're going to. Yes, sir. I have big shoes to fill. <laughs> 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 so I worked for like, I don't know, two months on it, I guess. Got it all down. And. Uh, <clears throat> I got through it, and then most people were rather amazed that I did it without having to be prompted or anything. But I taught for 30 years in medical school. I had to do a lot of memorizing. I mean, you don't get up in front of the class, have a doctorate degree, and then go, whoa, 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 I don't know. <laughs> so I had to talk a lot. <clears throat> I had to cover mistakes quickly. And... I had to memorize. I just memorized things, lots of things. So I got along fine. That's the way to get ahead in masonry. You do what nobody else wants to do. Keep volunteering. <laughs> keep doing it. Other people think you're a sucker for always volunteering, but you do get ahead. And I did. You so, get value out of uh, the contribution. Oh, yeah. The craft oh, yeah. gets value out of the contribution. And I went to uh, 
several of the 33rd degrees before I got mine, just, just for the heck of it. I just wanted to see what they were like. And this one young kid was, a, he was some kind of a motivational speaker, I guess. And he said, it was, he said, why did all you guys join the Scottish Rite? Tell me. And they were getting up, oh, I want to be a better Mason. I wanted to improve myself as a man and a Mason. I wanted to do good. <clears throat> and I got to me, I said, I wish I had nice things like that to say. I joined because I heard once a month, the Scottish Rite has a dinner with an open bar. And so at that time, it was only $15. I said, my wife could go with me and then we can share that. I, I was looking for something where my wife and I could share. And we did. Oh, I'm sorry. I married again. Uh, the, the, yeah, I forgot about that. And <clears throat> moved down here. Yeah, down here where South Jersey from uh, Hamilton Square. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, I, I said, that's why I joined the Scottish Rite. <laughs> and I felt, everybody else said all these wonderful things. Oh, my God. I guess they're a bunch of saints or something. Uh, they thought they were going to work their way into heaven. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, that's my story of how I got here. Now, so, as far as the book goes, I quickly was disillusioned with our degrees. I always maintain that these degrees were written for a, a mason of 1900, 1890-1900, a farmer who only read the Bible and seed catalogs, spent all day looking at the rear end of his horse who was plowing for him. His only relief from <clears throat> this life was going to his blue lodge once a month. And perhaps he went through the chairs, you know, took part in the degrees and eventually became master of his lodge. That was the high point of his life. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Now the degrees <clears throat> in the blue lodge are rites of passage. The candidate has to take part in them. He walks around with the junior ward or senior ward or whoever he walks around with and does things and things happen to him and so on. Uh, you don't do that in the course in the Scottish Rite. The Scottish Rite, the class just sits there and watches the stage. And the stage ritual is taken care of by you know, Scottish Rite masons who uh, dress up in costume and so on. Fine. Well, the one thing was the degrees themselves. Now, I'm just going to mention something. We have a bunch of, uh, at my medical school before I retired, uh, we got a bunch of Russian students in. And I had heard stories that in Russia, there were mammoths, extinct elephants. And a lot of them, herds of them, had somehow, for some reason, gotten quick, free, quick frozen, I guess, flash frozen, if you will. We don't know how it happened, but they did. And their bodies sunk into the tundra. And they were in there for 10,000, 15,000 years. Well, now they're valuable because they have big tusks and the ivory of those tusks are quite valuable. And you have to get a license yeah. to dig them up. That's right. In fact, it's one of the only fair trade ivory you can get today. And it's expensive right. because they, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So <clears throat> anyway, it's said that the meat of these mammoths was good to eat believe it or not. And I, some of the, my students had known guys who had been in these ivory camps looking for the tusks. Okay. So did you know anybody who ate the meat of the mammoths? He said, Oh yes. He said, boy, you got to have a lot of vodka to get that taste out. They had absolutely no flavor. They were uh, freezer burn and they had 10,000 years. It's long time to be in the freezer. And <laughs> they, they didn't taste like anything. They had no taste. That is what I think is wrong with our degrees. They have no flavor anymore. They've been hung up too long in time and they've been, they've lost their flavor. What I did after I have each degree, as you, as you know, I have a historical background. That is my, the flavor I'm trying to put back in the degree, the historical background. I can't, I can't change the degree. Of course, I'm not allowed to do that, but uh, I can certainly write what I want in the historical background. And I do, I write a lot. As some people have pointed out, one guy said, <clears throat> my thing on the Civil War was too long. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> you can't please everybody. 
So tell us how you got started writing the book. Were you asked to write the book or was this just like a pet project that you just said, I'm going to put this together? Not at all. The one thing I wanted to do, Robert, was I wanted to put flavor back in the rituals because that is what the candidates expected when they came. They had probably read about these Masonic rituals. They thought they were going to see something exotic. Well, sure. all they got was Moses or Solomon and his temple, for God's sake. They, you know, stuff they heard in Bible school or something when they were kids. And I wanted to put something else in, so I put the historical background in. The reason is one thing, membership. Membership is the pot of gold at the end of the Masonic rainbow. I made that up, but the, you, can, you can all use it. You don't have to give me credit. Trademark. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, yes. Without membership, literally, we're nothing. <laughs> I mean, without membership, we wouldn't exist. But to have membership, you have to please the members in some way. And masonry doesn't put a lot into pleasing members. They talk a lot about it. Uh, and there's fellowship and so on. But in this day and age, we're not the farmer of 1900 anymore. Uh, in those days, he probably had, the farmer had a fourth grade education, perhaps. Nobody went to high school, and the high school was a, a, an exotic thing. Rich kids went to high school. Now, everybody graduates from high school, and a, a, most kids go to at least community colleges. They get advanced uh, learning in various things. And let's face it, television has made us people of the world. We're mm -hmm. not hicks anymore. We're not confined. We're not uh, parochial in a sense. We are now people who have seen many, many countries. You can, you can see anything on television for right. programs. You can see historic, a lot of historical stuff. And most of us are quite sophisticated, I think. More sophisticated than certainly than they were back in 1900. And so we're not that farmer who just looked at the behind of his horse all day. We, we've been around, we have seen things, we are educated, and we're urban, we're urbanized, if you will. Uh, I don't care if you live in Podunk, uh, Idaho or something, you're still urbanized if you have a television set. And so I tried to put as much flavor as I could in the historical background of each degree. Now, in doing so, of course, I <laughs> we all have our own opinions. And... <laughs> Uh, not all of my opinions were complimentary to uh, the Scottish right because of the degree. Well, I, I thought some of the degrees were frankly ridiculous. Uh, I, I, I don't think I better name the degrees. I think I'll get some kind of. <laughs> but just well, sure. I, I, I think you get the idea if you just go through. Yeah. I, so when I joined Freemasonry for the listeners, a lot of them have listened for a long time and they kind of know my history. And, um, you know, I had some beef, I think, um, uh, I don't mean like, you know, real beef or anything, but I had some strong opinions about the Northern Masonic jurisdiction myself. Uh, when I had joined, uh, the Scottish Rite, um, I was unaware of a, a Northern and Southern jurisdiction. Uh, I didn't know there were two different ones. And so my first reunion, actually, I was able to, um, view a third degree that the Scottish Rite uh, had put on from the Valley of New Orleans um, for us. And they were a traveling degree team and they were there for us. And which was really confusing because I, here I am sitting at this table with what they called Scottish degree lodge members. And I'm like, I don't understand. I, I, you know, I don't get this. And so it took me a while to understand that the, this whole, you know, jurisdictional difference in 15 States versus the rest. And, um, I thought, well, wow. And they said, well, yeah. So I go up to my, my Scottish Rite Valley in the library. There's all this learning materials and these great books. And I'm like, well, where's the, where's the, the, the book of the degrees? Where can I read that? And uh, well, they don't, first of all, they don't, they really, my particular Valley at that time, um, it was more difficult to get a hold of the copies of the degrees. Uh, when you do get them, it's like, hey, if you don't return this, we're going to hunt you down like Frankenstein, uh, <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein, right? And um, then the other was the the constant changes to the degrees that were happening 
um, made it, I think, difficult for, for me personally to say, you know, where's the tradition in, in constantly changing things? I was really confused by this idea. And uh, I finally got my hands on a, uh, uh, a PDF that was uh, published on the Scottish Rite Northern Jurisdictions website uh, that was, I think it was by Trexler or somebody. It was kind of like a, a history of changes that had been made to the degrees. It was very short. Um, and then I, I thought, wow, this is just crazy. There's no real learning opportunity with these degrees other than sitting in the audience. And they weren't even giving the, um, at the time, uh, what we would call the, the preamble or the, you know, the, the introduction. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the, the context to the degree. Right. And uh, I was like, this is crazy. So then I went down to the Southern jurisdiction, which is four hours from my house. I, I went to the Valley of St. Louis, Missouri, and I joined there also and saw those degrees and was just enamored by this program. They had the master craftsman. Oh, and by the way, I got a book, the ritual monitor and guide. I was like, Oh, this is great. So I contact, you know, my, my Northern jurisdiction uh, secretaries and things. Hey, where do I get this book for us? And they said, we don't have one. I said, what do you mean you don't have one? And uh, this was very difficult for me to, to digest. And in fact, for a, a brief period of time, I had demitted from the Northern jurisdiction for a lack of educational resources. It was kind of my vote with my feet, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then Glatley, uh, illustrious Glatley had come along and, um, I watched a webinar with him and they had talked about the Houtgrade Academy. And I said, oh, they're actually launching an educational program. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I re-upped my membership, which was not a big deal. I said, okay, cool. And, uh, you know, I enrolled in the HGA, but I never actually accomplished it. I never got to get in because they keep the classes kind of like small and I missed the window or something. But I just thought how how frustrating it was in the beginning with no educational resource um, and missing a lot of context with some of the stuff that goes along. Um, in particular, somebody would say, well, what's the Royal secret? I said, well, in the Southern jurisdiction, you know, we have the Prince of the Royal secret, master of the Royal secret in the Southern jurisdiction. They just say what it is. They just say the Royal secret is this. And in the Northern jurisdiction, I had seen the degree like three or four times. And I thought, Nope, nobody ever told me what it is. I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I still don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's very, very bizarre the way um, it had been conducted. And I think just the Northern jurisdiction in general has a, had a, had a lack of uh, understanding with uh, what was needed in terms of educational resources. And, and, you know, people are interested. They are interested in the history. They're interested in the context they're interested in the stories of the degrees themselves um, because without those additional details, you're left wondering how is this applicable to me or yeah. how is the story, right. you know, why is this story even being told to me? Um, when you say you wanted to flavor this up a little bit and you added this kind of historical background, can you tell me uh, just some of the examples of, of what this would entail? Well, uh, take the degree, I can't think of the number now, or the Pope and the Frederick, the King of Sicily, Sicily are meeting in the, uh, I believe the uh, degrees of the military knights meeting in their headquarters. And the Pope is trying to get Frederick to take over the, I think the sixth or seventh uh, crusade that he's trying to get going. What does that teach you? The king of Sicily is going to take over a crusade. The Pope's getting into I mean, I'm not a Pope. I'm not the king of Sicily. What on earth does this have to do with me? It's, uh, I don't know. I think it was, uh, you and I were both raised in the, as Roman Catholics, I understand. And we both yeah. now think of ourselves as deists, mm -hmm. I understand, from reading your stuff. Yeah. Okay, fine. But. I have a feeling it was written in the good old days when uh, there was a lot of anti-Catholic feeling in the masonry and masonry. And perhaps because the Pope was made to every time the least little thing happens, he flies into a rage and threatens to excommunicate everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a fool. So I got the chance to play the Pope and I turned that around. Uh, if you are bold enough, and you are feel confident enough when you do the degrees, 
Nobody knows what the heck's in the decree or what the words are or anything. So I, Howard uh, Kanowitz, the other guy, he played the Frederick, and we always played together in, in these these uh, degrees, and especially great when we were adversaries, because then the sparks really fly. And we tried to make it so that there was some value to this. So there's got to be a value. Somebody's got to do something good to be contrasted to something bad. <clears throat> and it was rather difficult to find that. So we kind of, we both of us made up a little bit of our own dialogue. <laughs> uh, and to, to, to point out things that we think needed pointing out. And in the end, I gave everybody the papal blessing, and, and uh, they were all purified. And I think everybody <laughs> was fine. But that's, uh, I, I guess my point was we, we tried to change things a little, as much as we could without being too apparent uh, to, to bring out something that people could put their teeth into. <laughs> they could say, oh, this is me. Okay, I, cause I'm, I'm that guy with the spear uh, who's getting a hard time or something like that because I want to do something right and uh, the king wants me to do something evil, but I'm not going to do it. Something of that nature. I think that that context setting for for me and and one of the big value statements from from the book is some of that context setting that traditionally we would not receive at a reunion if the introduction um, isn't 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 read. So you can identify if not with the characters, but with their moral quandaries or the situations that they might be might be in because it it, it translates. Um, although a, a positive shift that I'm certainly seeing at, at least in in our valley is you know the return of um, you know, the, the introductions and then the, and some dis discussion to follow, to reiterate what, what are the, you know, core values exhibited. And it's not just sit in a theater and passively observe, but now to engage. So I think, you know, the advent of the HGA program and, and those, those changes are bringing like meaning and value, you know, back to the, to the degree activity of the Scottish right. There's one thing I have against the, this high degree program. Membership. It doesn't do anything for membership. These guys are already already Scottish Rite Masons. So they're learning more about the degrees. Okay, fine. That's nice. But it's not getting more members in. And our membership, as I think we all know, is, is going down right now. Uh, we used to have, even now in 2007, when I joined the Scottish Rite, now this isn't 100 years ago, 2007, we would have like 25 or 30 candidates at a reunion. Now we're lucky if we have seven or eight. That all these guys getting studying the high degrees, well, that's fine. They're getting. I don't know what. What do you get? Certificates or ballpoint pens or something? Or, you know, cool hat when you're done. Wow. Well, and and really? the knowledge that you yeah, because it's a yellow, yellow hat, right, Robert? It? I, it's a yellow hat, I think. I know in a lot of valleys right now, you know, yellow hat in the northern jurisdiction is reserved for an officer. I don't know if we get if we get much for. I know we got a certificate. They have a certificate program. They give you a, you get the title HGA. So that's cool after, if your name, if, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it offers something for the current member as a value proposition. You know, when they tell everybody that it, the Scottish Rite is the College of Freemasonry. So in that aspect, I think it meets something. But on the okay. other hand, you know, I mean, for the member, the Blue Lodge member who wants more, I'm not sure where to go. You know, does the yeah. does the HD address that? I don't know. Also, the high grade program actually appeals to the intellectual person. Well, in masonry, that's about maybe three percent, maybe five percent. So it's it doesn't really hit. I don't think a lot of people. Uh, maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I, mean, well, I, no. I think that though. That's that's. Sorry, Robert, go ahead. No, 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 absolutely. I think that's a very wonderful call out. Uh, the, the idea of the, you know, we have this, we have this romanticized idea that all Masons are these intellectual philosophical titans and we, we just aren't right. I mean, uh, there are a significant number of us, I think, but overall, if, if, if a grand body, for instance, said we need to do something for the mass majority of our members, it's not going to be the HGA, right? It's going to be something else. Um, <clears throat> the HGA, 
you know, it checks boxes for me. It, it might check boxes for Chris or yourself or, you know, any number of, uh, of our intellectual brethren, you know, who are into things like the allied Masonic degrees or other things. But um, it, it is by far, um, I, I mean, it's a wish. It's a wish I had that, you know, all of our members were these philosophical minded Titans, but, you know, we just, we just aren't. Um, and I think, uh, I think you're right there. But I think though, that there's opportunity to inspire someone to pursue that path. And I'll, I'll speak from, from personal experience, having been a, a awakened to it. You know, I, I, think that in my earlier days, I would identify as a scotch and stogie type Mason. And it certainly was a, a, not to pat myself on the back, but a good ritualist and, you know, di did the things, but. Hey, I'm all uh, for the scotch. Part. Yeah, I say, hey, <laughs> we should have brought some. Especially Highland. <laughs> uh, darn, we forgot, we forgot this, we forgot the provisions <laughs> for, our, for our meeting tonight. But, um, but in my personal experience, after being sort of awakened to the opportunity that I didn't know was there, it changed my mindset and inspired me. I'm, I'm an engineer. I have an engineering background. I had no basis. I actively got out of, you know, I tricked my advisors into getting me out of like having to take philosophy 101. So I didn't have to, right? Like, they're like, oh, we, we need a math curriculum here. I don't need any of that stuff. But as you know, an adult now and revisiting that, I'm taking independent study philosophy classes because I missed out on that. And I'm inspired now to do so, having met learned and well-informed brethren. And maybe other guys will be inspired when they're when they're ready, right? So, some guys just need the spark, the spark of interest. And maybe HGA is one example of a spark. Maybe it won't speak to them all, but it's I, for me, there's there's a there's a spark because I'll be totally honest that I was a scotch and stokes mason and now I'm go I'm I'm starting to explore the deep end and very much loving it and breaking away from my engineering mindset. I want to ask you about something that might um and if you want to dodge the question that's totally fine. Uh the description of your book, right? We have a quote mm -hmm. from from uh illustrious brother Glatley and he actually says that this work meets the vision of the Northern Masonic jurisdiction as an inspirational, enjoyable, and convenient to read at one's leisure, right? That comes directly from the uh, past sovereign grand commander is the immediate past. Um, and it's a must read for all Scottish Rite Masons as it is enjoyable in education simultaneously. A great quote. So my question is what's so kind of interesting to me. And when I say interesting, it's interesting in, in a way that I think is, uh, confusing why this particular book with the amount of context it adds to the degree experience and understanding is it's not required reading in, in, in something like HGA or, um, or promoted actively. You know, I would love to see a Scottish right post on Facebook that said, buy this book. Uh, okay. I, I am curious about, uh, about that. It, it feels weird. You have to, understand, Robert, that a great deal of masonry is an old boys club. And if you're one of the old boys, fine. Uh, well, about five years ago, I, I saw that they were, they were talking about replacing some of these uh, degrees with new degrees. And so I said, okay, I told Dave, I, walk, I worked with Dave Whiteley for 10 years. We, we, we were pretty close, we were good friends. And I said, look, Dave, I'm going to write a degree. I'm going to write it about Brother Harry Truman. And uh, let's get something up to date. And it's going to have some life in it because it'll be a meeting of Truman with his cabinet and, and some uh, generals and admirals on the presidential yacht going down the Potomac or somewhere. And it's called The Morning of a Thousand Suns. That was the morning the atomic bomb was tested in New Mexico, and they had just gotten word of the test worked. And they have a, I have a little thing I've, I copied out of a history book of what the, what the uh, telegram was. And I had one of the characters read it. And, I mean, in the script, I played in it. I played on the stage too, but I, I just was, this, I was a scientific advisor and I had a pipe and I didn't do much. Anyway, Dave Glatley was crazy about it. He was so crazy that he took the script and he went up to Lexington 
himself, they rejected it. He got back and he was, well, I won't say what he said. And uh, he said, all right, this play is now a public play. You can do it wherever you want. We, we put it on three times as a fundraiser. And we had a packed house every night. And what it was, was, of course, Truman. We had one guy from uh, the Central Valley that looked and talked like Truman. He, he could have <laughs> been Truman. Uh, and we had other guys, of course. And I gave myself some lines in the middle where I got mad because they were upset because I had hired uh, Robert Oppenheimer to head the project. And he was considered a communist. They or what's his name? J. Edgar Hoover thought he was a communist or something. And the guy started giving me a hard time and I fought back. We had some, everybody liked that. Okay. So the next year I went to the, again, the 33rd thing, I don't know where the heck it was. And I saw head of the ritual committee and he gave me verbal permission to write this book and publish it. Okay, fine. And I said, you know, last year, Dave Gwantley brought you a play I wrote, and it was about Harry Truman. And everybody thought it was fantastic. The audiences loved it. Why'd you reject it? He said, oh, well, uh, we have somebody writing a play about Truman. But uh, since then, I've seen other things and seen that. So it taught me a lesson. It said, a friend of mine, uh, uh, he's been writing a degree on the Alamo. He's been writing it for about three years, maybe four. He's submitted it to Lexington, I think, three times. He's trying for a fourth now. And I said, well, lots of luck, <laughs> because I don't think you're getting it. You're going to get anywhere with it. It's not a game of virtue or merit or anything like that. I mean, you could you could write a play worthy of Shakespeare or something, and uh, it wouldn't matter, unless Shakespeare was an old boy in the uh, ritual committee or something. and. These are things you have to work with. These are things you have to accept. You know, you can't change them. Sure, sure. So that's that was uh, my experience with the ritual committee. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. You know, we've had. I've seen lots of the degree revisions, and I have uh, some of them. I have thought, wow, in bad taste. Uh, some of them I, I like. You know. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I used to be a staunch, um, anti change the degrees person. I thought, you know, why can't you just leave the Franken manuscript degrees alone and perform them as they are? Uh, but we all know, I think anybody who's read those initial original degrees knows that there's just no possible way to be able to put on those kinds of degrees on a stage like that, uh, with the, uh, the, the type of organization that we have, um, I wanted to ask you about the reception of the book from brothers who have gotten into it. Um, you know, the book's been out for a few years now. What, what's been the general reception of the book? Maybe not like you heard what Glatley had said, but uh, from the general brother, the, the brethren of the, the Northern and Southern jurisdiction, any, any particular feedback that sticks out to you? They're crazy about, it. they're yeah. all crazy about it. Uh, <clears throat> one of my uh, friends, one of my acquaintances, bought the book and he was reading it. He said to a friend, look at the book I have. And the guy looks at, I got to have this book. <laughs> that, that, has been the, the, uh, that has been the attitude of most people who have not seen the book and read it. Uh, in, in one uh, reunion, I, I was just told recently, I forget by whom, and uh, they, I don't know how many candidates they had, 20 or 30. It was, it was one of these big valleys. And they had the, they gave the candidates their children to this book. And many of the ones who did bought it on their own when they, when they got a look at it. It's fantastic. Uh, you know, my first uh, trip down to the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Valley of St. Louis um, before I was a candidate, I was a visitor uh, as a, a northern jurisdiction member, just witnessing degrees. And I got to watch that these these new uh, 14th degree Masons got their ring. And then when they got their 32nd degree, they got their black cap and they all got a copy of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. 
And I was like, I was like, wow, that's. And they all use this as a door stopper. <laughs> you, you know, it, it, it's a such a difficult um, read just because of we we've, we've talked about it. I've talked about it on the show ad nauseum, but you know, it's uh, it's a great book um, if you don't mind. You know, insane run on sentences, and uh, uh, you almost have to have a, a religious thesaurus next to you to get through it. Then uh, a few years later, I was at a reunion, and they replaced it. They stopped giving away morals and dogma, and they gave away Rex, Rex Hutchins Bridge to Light. And I thought, well, that's Bridge great. Line, yeah. yeah. What a, what a great, uh, I mean, in my honest opinion, uh, I think, I think morals and dogma is a good book. I think morals and dogma, um, that's been annotated by De Hoyos is a better book. I think a bridge to light is the best book. Um, <clears throat> just for me, um, speaking I understand. For, and, um, there's just been no, uh, no answer to that in the Northern jurisdiction. And I thought for the longest time when, when the Masonic pageant came out, I thought, uh, you know, I'd love to approach my, my Valley chair. And I'm sure that's still on the table, but as of, you know, before this year, I was not a, uh, I was not an officer of my Valley. Um, mm-hmm. I was doing other things. And this year I said, you know, I got to get back. I got to give back to my Valley. I've been a member for, you know, 10 years. I got to do something. So I started at the Lodge of Perfection. I'm just the uh, the good old Tyler, uh, but I do a lot of stuff for education. And so one of the things that I want to do as an education person for my Valley is, can we give a copy of this to all of our candidates? Um, I think um, with the addition of adding the historical uh, portion to the degree before the degree, having the degree. And then having conversation after the degree, maybe uh, for those interested, and then also giving all of our candidates a book that says, hey, this is the historical breakdown of this stuff. If you want an actual copy of the degree, you know, talk to the Valley Secretary or whatever, but this book's going to give you what you want. Um, have you? And you said that maybe one Valley has already uh, done this. Uh, so that's a, a step, I think, in the right direction. Our Valley, uh, at least once. Uh, and got a lot of uh, copies of this book from, uh, Paul, from uh, Mike Paul and uh, gave it to the the candidates at the at the reunion. I don't know if they're still doing that or not. I think they're out. No. <laughs> given um, that the given that the degrees themselves change so often, um, this book in particular, you know, published uh, twenty seventeen. Um, yeah, there's there's been some revisions, right, in the degree work. Do you have any plans on potentially updating some of it or adding a, a section, amendments, or addendums? I don't get too much into the fine points of the degree. Uh, the ritual committee would be upset if I did. Frankly, I had they had to go through this twice, and they they rejected it the first time, and the second time they finally agreed. But uh, the saints have an unholy fear that people are going to read their degrees and then they're going to read their minds and then they're going to control them. And they're, or I don't know what the heck they're worried about, but uh, oh, they're so afraid that I think if you put the whole degree yeah. out here, it, it would be fine. Yeah. But the, the, the Northern, <laughs> Northern uh, Masonic jurisdiction has a, I, really an unholy fear. That. It is is so interesting that you you mention it because for the longest time I it's been in the back of my mind is like I think an unsaid crit, critique, but I've I've not had uh, I've not had the mind to say anything out loud about it because it's, I always think like well maybe they have their reasons right well, um, they do and and yeah. they I am sure they do you know I, don't know I just they are but they do. <laughs> exactly I don't know what they are either but yeah but I'm with you. Um, it, it is just a, an incredible uh, weirdness that, that exists there. I mean, uh, the Master Craftsman Program from the Southern Jurisdiction, for instance, is, uh, is open to anybody, anybody in the world, not even a Scottish Rite Mason can just go on the site, buy the book and take the class. That's crazy, mm-hmm. you know, but uh, <laughs> 180 degrees off. But, but Frank, um, to address Robert's question, you are thinking about updating the, the book with oh, yeah. uh, the latest uh, yeah. well, w- a Rev 2 hopefully coming. There's maybe? only one ritual that's been changed. Only one change since 2017? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the fourth degree. And oh yeah, Master Builder. Look, yeah. It's one page. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is take my PDF of the book 
and send it back to Mike Pohl with that one page changed. There you go. And see what happens. You heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> Woo-woo. I'll have to buy I it again. <laughs> I, uh, I, I sense um, resistance to the book in high, high places. All right. And yeah. I don't know who or where or what. I just sense there's some something that keeps them from really saying, hey, we're going to adopt this book. One thing is I openly criticize several of the degrees in this book. Now, you could say, well, that wasn't wise. Well, no one's ever accused me of being wise. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to say it. And I had to say that, uh, for instance, this uh, Oregon Trail degree, all right, uh, they said, well, that was put forth as a test, I believe, uh, so we could, members could read it and to see how they liked it better than or didn't like it or whatever, and uh, maybe act as an inspiration, if you will, for, to, to write degrees and submit them to us. Well, of course, if they turn down everything that's submitted to them. I don't know what's good that's going to do. But <laughs> uh, such is the wisdom of the of the upper echelons. But anyway, I did put two or three uh, critical comments in the book. And in one case, uh, when I have it in the back and I, I, I give the uh, history of the degree, I, I put a caveat before you get to the degree. So now I've said that uh, I've said some uncomplimentary things about this degree. The people who reviewed it like Glatley and so on, I, I said, didn't see this. Uh, I put that in later. Okay, they're not responsible. That's totally on my shoulders. So anyway, uh, I guess what the people upstairs want is something that agrees with everything they believe and want totally, which means you have to mention God in every other sentence. You have to mention saying prayers in every other sentence. I have nothing. The book is a secular book. There is no religion in it at all. I mention religions. I discuss religions, but I do not present any religion as if it were real or true or did any good. That is absolutely fascinating. And to be quite honest, uh, refreshing uh, for somebody uh, I mean, like-minded um, in, in such ways. When you said you've sensed some resistance uh, I, I totally understand where you're coming from because I think I've seen this also. You know, we, we want to, organizations do like to control the message. They want to control the, uh, the control the message so they control how they're seen. You have to have continuity in the message across all things. Um, and what I love about the book actually is it's so objective uh, in the sense that uh, you know if it's your opinion on something, you've called this out. And when you're being very, again, objective opinion. So for those people out there listening, they're like, oh, what's the difference between subjective and, uh, you know, objective. Think about your subjective as your own personal opinion versus a, a wide spectrum opinion of all things and, you know, considering all things. So uh, the way, Frank, you wrote this was, you know, in my opinion, just very, uh, like a very, not obtuse in a bad way, obtuse, a wide spectrum. Uh, look at these degrees from a point of view that is not uh, coming at this with uh, preconceived notions uh, or uh, from a particular viewpoint uh, or vantage point of a religion or, you know, some philosophy. Uh, so when, when considering these things, when you were writing this book, I am curious, was it difficult to put forth a lot of what you did in the book without touching on religious elements. I mean, let's face it, the Scottish Rite has some heavy religious overtones, even in the Northern jurisdiction, take out the submarine degree, take out the Oregon Trail. You know, even when you go back to these, uh, you know, craft type degrees in the Lodge of Perfection, the Rose Croix, uh, Knights Kadosh, all of these things, was it difficult to, to not get super religious and wind into that? On the contrary, I enjoyed every minute of it. I loved it. That's awesome. Yes. Now you have to understand, Robert, the masonry is becoming more and more like a religion, which it's not supposed to be. And they're 
powers that be are getting more and more like a, oh, I don't know, the Cardinals in the Vatican or something, you know, oh, that's, everything has to be according to a certain way. You can't have a heretic around all that sort of thing. And I sense that. Having been raised a Catholic, I sense it very easily. I can, I can feel that, uh, believe me. <laughs> it's like red lights going off. And so we shall see. I, I have hopes that this thing, this book is going to conquer all that. But, you know, every idiot has a dream. <laughs> well, I think it certainly will. I think by talking about the book and, and having you come on the program to talk a little bit about it and the the uh, the beautiful stories you're telling about writing it and the context behind it and the difficulties that the book has faced, um, which it has, you know, uh, it will help brothers, I think, across, you know, not just the 15 northern jurisdiction states. I mean, we've got some very curious southern jurisdiction brothers who uh, who often think only in the sense of I've heard rumors about your weird northern jurisdiction degrees well now no longer right they don't have to be weird you don't have to have a rumor here it is check out this it's got a great historical context behind it and uh maybe after you read this and some of what brother frank has put forth you might you won't think it's so silly or maybe you'll agree with him and you'll think ah maybe this this and this might be a little out of place but uh you know certainly this book has its place on every masonic shelf thank you i've tried to be as fair as I could to every degree. I put enough in it so that if you read it, you'd oh, say, okay, that's what the degree is about. And when you saw the degree, you wouldn't be totally surprised or shocked or anything. I, I think I did it. On the other hand, I didn't give away whatever <laughs> they thought was so secret. To, I hope, I don't think <laughs> I did. I, I think that the, the key is sort of that academic and objective approach, right? We, we as humans and we as Masons, should naturally, you know, question and seek truth, tr seek, seeking truth. And the, the degrees of the Scottish Rite were, let's be honest, written by humans and not necessarily that long ago. So uh, a healthy dose of objective measure to, you know, understand them in context, why they were written the way they were. And maybe there were some mistakes in, in, yeah. in, in their writing is just being objective about it and only helps to connect closer to the content. Now, at the end of each degree, what, uh... I, I summarized the uh, teachings of that degree in a few sentences, that's all. And I try to be fair to the degree. If I say we should pray to God for something, I say we should pray to God for something. That's what the degree teaches. I don't want to mess with that at all. Yeah, well, you, so you certainly uh, have a great accomplishment in this book. Brother Conway, in some of uh, my prep for this, this interview, I was taking some notes and I had talked to Brother Chris uh, about your viewpoint on the degree, the, the degrees themselves. And we talked a little bit about this idea of experience versus uh, witnessing, witnessing a degree, not going through it versus a, an experiential thing. Um, and he had mentioned that, that you have both talked about this in the past as well. And I'm, I'm curious for our audience, uh, uh, if you could talk to us a little bit about this idea of experience versus witness and if there's a pro on either or a con for them, and just your general thoughts. Well, in the Blue Lodge degrees, of course, well, I like every candidate experience them. I went through them. And of course, the last one, as we know, was quite interesting. And uh, I'll never forget the very first time I went in blindfolded. I, this is a long time ago, this is 75. And men used aftershave lotion and underarm you, and it was hot. And I walked in that room and I thought, uh oh, they're trying to gas me. They're trying to kill me. Oh my God, I, I couldn't believe it. I almost gagged. And when I was in medical school, the, doc, the doctors always said, look, tell every patient of yours when he comes to see you, don't put on aftershave lotion, don't put on underarm deodorant, don't put anything like that. Because you're going to have to see every patient. If they all have them, you're going to be sick to your stomach by the end of the day. And boy, I'll tell you, I'll never forget that night. Whew. Uh, afterwards, I kind of got used to it. But uh, 
that was something else. Anyway, in those rites of passage, I sort of got the feel. I could get a feel of what's happening. And okay, I understand this. Certain things are going to be read to me. I'm expected later to, of course, memorize them, which I did, and pass the test in the following meeting. But I could see on the altar, there's certain things, and you're expected to do certain things, and you have to do that. And I didn't mind that at all. I, I was going through it, and I felt, hey, I'm being initiated as a mason. That's fine. That's great. And that was good. Okay. Now, when I got in the Scottish Rite, and I watched the degrees, of course, the first time at the first reunion, when I was just a candidate. They, I couldn't participate in anything, so I just watched them. And I thought, oh, well, they're all right, I guess, you know. And then uh, the second time I went, which was like two months later, uh, that's when I got my, uh, well, I didn't get a hat of any kind, but I, I got my uh, 32nd degree anyway. And uh, I thought, something's missing. Something's missing here. And I couldn't quite figure out. Then I realized, I'm going to get on stage. And as soon as I volunteered, of course, again, you have to volunteer. So I'll, I'll do the job. And a lot of guys don't want to go on stage. So I got on stage, wore the costume, memorized lines. And I was getting something out of that degree because I was right up there. But okay, well, how many of us were eight, nine, ten, ten guys up on the stage? I'm sure we all were, were getting something from that degree. But, uh, you know, a hundred people out in the audience weren't, I don't think. So that's all I can tell you, Robert, is participation in the degree makes it a rite of passage. And it makes you feel like you've been initiated into something, okay? Like an Australian Aborigine getting circumcised or something. Uh, that's their ritual. Watching something on a stage is another experience entirely. It's a different means of con conveyance. Like the, yeah, it's a different means of conveyance. But I guess, Frank, for you, you by participating in the stage drama later, uh, maybe as an exemplar, but then later as a as a performer, that connected you closer to the material. It took it from you were a witness originally to now a participant through your participation as a performer. Well, from two thousand and eight until. The COVID uh, years came. I was in every, I was in every, uh, and our degree for our, yeah. our uh, valley for uh, every reunion. And God knows, uh, I guess that's why I never got my, uh, what's the name, that uh, passport. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with that. You're right, right. Yeah, uh, we have. It, it's well, hard to witness them when you're performing passports. them. That doesn't wait. Doesn't that count? You you participated. It doesn't. It's count. supposed to count. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it count. well, the trouble is, when you're on stage, it's really counting. You can't get it in your. Or you can't get the other four that are being performed. Right, exactly. That day if, <laughs> right. if you're backstage, no, spend all your time taking clothes off, putting your clothes on, and so on. <laughs> so I anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. I probably didn't. No, I think you did. I think you did. I think there's there's something extremely valuable in exactly what you said. Uh, the perhaps participation is where we get, uh, you know, maybe the last bit or the full impart of what a degree is trying to convey to us. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm kind of reminded of something Brother Glatley said when he was asked a question uh, on a webinar early on when he first took office. And it was something along the lines of, uh, you know, are there going to be more video degrees and something like this? And he didn't really answer that question. But what he did, what I do remember him saying was that he found extreme value in the performance of the degrees on stage live with your brothers. A lot, and, of, a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. And I, I feel that way, too. And only did I recognize that when I started to, to perform degrees for the Scottish Rite. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, I, I woke up one morning, I had an email from, uh, from one of the chairman of the, the degrees, and it wasn't like, hey, can you be in this degree? It was just like, hey, Lodge of Perfection, here's everybody and here's your parts. Be at these two rehearsals and the degree is this. And I was like, oh, that's how we're doing it? Okay. You know, but for <laughs> sure, I, I, I had to play the part in the, uh, in the 14th degree. 
um, where we do the uh, like the offering, the uh, the aroba. So I was doing the aroba, offering the bread and wine kind of thing. And um, that being at those rehearsals and working with those people, you also form bonds with people who I had not previously thought were the kind of people I would normally get along with. And I found out that those people are amazing. <laughs> you know, what do we always say? Masonry brings together people who would have remained at a perpetual distance, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it is, it is quite, quite ingenious and quite amazing what we, what we happen well, to do. That's true, Robert. And I think that is one of the great, wonderful things about Masonry. You can't beat fellowship. Okay. Now to be in fellowship, you have to be a member. So membership then go, goes to fellowship. But if you're not doing something that's going to improve or uh, encourage membership, you know, you're not going to get the people to uh, become part of the fellowship. I agree. Well, this has been an insanely amazing episode, this, this interview. Uh, Brother Chris, I can't thank you enough for setting this up. Brother Frank, thank you for taking the time to do this and for writing this book. Uh, because honestly, you are a literal hero to anybody who wanted something to grab onto, something to hold in their hand uh, regarding the degree, experience, and work that they that they have. So I have to thank you guys both so much from the bottom of my heart. I know all the listeners are thinking the same thing. Um, I'm going to put links to the book in the show notes so that anybody who wants it, we're going to make sure that people can click on that and get their copy of the book. Um and, uh, you know, when, when you have a revised edition come out, we're going to share that out too. Um, but you guys, I have to thank you. And I'll, I'll pass it back to you guys for any uh, final thoughts or comments. Okay. Here's a final thought. Here's the book. This is what it looks like. Uh, Shameless plug. Uh, well, an advertisement was put out on for our Valley and had the wrong picture. <laughs> Oh gosh! It had another. The book had a. We were uh, Mike Paul and I were going over what we should put as a cover. And we were making suggestions, and I put a suggestion with a picture of uh, Herod's temple, and I thought it looked pretty cool. But he thought this was. I know this is fine with me. I love this now. It's uh, makes it look mystical or something. I don't. Know. I, I might have somehow been involved in that error, or maybe maybe not. Sorry, Frank. Oh, <laughs> very bad. So, you'll hear from my lawyer That's Howard, right. Howard, <laughs> Howard <laughs> contacting you. <laughs> Well, um, Robert, I just want to say it was great to be able to uh, uh, connect you with Frank and, and be able to bring him on the program. I, uh, I had purchased uh, the, the book actually specifically for the HGA program. Um, and, and anecdotally, I've heard from a number of, of brethren, not just in my valley, but from you know, around that they had, they had done the same even uh, at one of these dinners that he mentioned. Um, at one of the dinners he mentioned earlier in the program. And I didn't know that he was the author of this book. I did, you know, it's just, <laughs> he's just a member, another idiot just, a, not, just another member of the Valley. We're just jaw, <laughs> we're just jaw boning. And here, here I am. I find out later, wait, I re, I'm reading the book Conway, Conway. I know that. I know that name. Wait a second. I, I sat next to that guy at that dinner, you know, a little, li, little did you know, so he, he didn't plug the book at dinner. So to, to, to be fair, uh, <laughs> you know, well, the chitsiest things I see are yeah. these politicians now who, who get up and they have their book yeah. in their shelf uh, behind uh, them like this. Uh, that's uh, right. We need to do that. Um, we, we, we might, we might've done that at our, our local Valley uh, yeah, presentation. We did. We did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you two, this has just been incredible for me. Um, I hope everybody out there who's listening at home or you're watching on YouTube that uh, you find this just as edifying and you go out and you grab this book. Um, again, not because it's making anybody rich, you guys, it's going to make you rich, uh, I think, in your educational experience and, and help you to understand uh, quite a I bit. I want to start cutting rich writing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> been, wait, wait, wait. They've gotten rich uh, um, intellectually. That's right. right. Intellectual rich. That's right. They, uh, they, you get that all there. Right. There you go. Absolutely. So. Well, anyway, you can get this on Amazon or from what's the, the guy's? Uh, Michael Poles. Uh, yeah. My, oh, Mike, Mike Poles. Cornerstone. Yeah. Cornerstone, Cornerstone Publishing. Press, Cornerstone Masonic Press. And if you put Louisiana or uh, no, New Orleans after that, you can't miss. Well, thanks so much, brothers. I will, I will let you go. And uh, once more, thank you so much. Thank you, thanks, Robert, Robert, for having us.
You've been a wonderful host. So once more, I want to thank illustrious Brother Conway, as well as Brother Chris Stebbins for all of their work and coming together to make this whole thing possible. Brother Stebbins, thank you for handling all the AV on your end. Um, I know it is no small task to get all these things worked out, but I want to thank you so much for your effort and getting this together and all of your uh, contributions to masonry and to this podcast. It is so highly valued, not only by myself, it's evident in the way brothers look to you for answers and your wisdom. So thank you so much. And Brother Conway, wow, uh, what incredible contribution you've made to Freemasonry with this. Um, I can only say that this is something we cannot put a value on, a, a dollar value. It's, uh, it's priceless for our fraternity to have. It's the first time this has really been done. I mean, there is like a weird kind of historical guide out there that was done a few years ago that was on the Scottish Rite website and taken down. Um, and it's still out there on archive.org if you care to find it. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But uh, also in the show notes, you'll find a link to get the book. And while we're on the topic of this, I'll just say we've got all of the books from the people who come on this program on the WCY shop in the bookstore. Uh, they're just hot links back to Amazon. It is an Amazon affiliate link. So when you buy from them, the book stays the same price as it would for you. The author gets their cut and WCY gets a few pennies. So I just want to be upfront and clear about that. All that money, of course, still goes right back into the production of this podcast. So I want to thank you guys in advance for checking all that out, including in all of our show links, our Amazon links as well. All right. That's it for this week. I want to thank everyone out there for joining us and taking this little journey on Masonic education with us. And as we close out this week, uh, I will take it out with a new audio track from Brother Aaron Chauncey, who gave us explicit permission to play his new track, uh, which is kind of a journey in masonry. And uh, that'll be the outgoing track this week. And if you're on the video, uh, the images that will be up are a tribute uh, to a departed brother that just passed away. Uh, and that is, this episode is dedicated to Brother Tim Thomason. Tim Uriah Thomason, who was uh, 36 years old and a close friend of the show, a close friend of all of the brothers here in Illinois and beyond. I really don't have the words to describe what Tim did for us. Um, I probably will write a little something for the Midnight Freemasons, but this episode is dedicated to Tim. Thank you, Tim, for all you've done for Freemasonry in this iteration. That's it for this week. Until next time, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. Up 
on 